start. All right, let's start as usual. Um, I'm gonna ask what you remember from the previous lecture. So what did we talk about? What stuck? Uh, what do you remember? Um, IT starts by typing. Um, we talked about machine learning pipe. You, you remembered everything, I guess, right? <laughs> I gave you advance notice to type this. Right, all those topics we talked about, uh, the machine learning pipeline, kind of how you, how data scientists tend to iterate very frequently and uh, working very exploratory, which is kind of different, I think, than what most of developers work. Advantages and disadvantages of notebooks, right? We talked about that. Um, classification versus regression tasks, ranking, hybrid, right? And then, um, right, the last part of the lecture, I tried to give you an intuition of how neural networks work, um, how back propagation works, how this, um, how this, in general, this approach might work. Um, and I don't, guess that this was sufficient to really give, give you a deep understanding of neural networks, but hopefully, and there was the idea here to give you an idea of how it roughly works, why it's so expensive, why the models get so big, why you need so much training data, um, why you typically use GPUs uh, to compute this kind of stuff. I had a little bit more material that I wanted to talk about, um, about, um, AI techniques that are not classic machine learning techniques, but symbolic AI techniques. But I wanna table this for now. I'm gonna come back to this later in the lecture because I kind of want to get to model quality, which is also relevant for the next homework assignment um, and get a bit more to software engineering content. So what I want to do today is talk about model quality. And I have, I'm going to have two parts here. Um, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to run out of time again and I'm going to continue next week. Um, but the first part is kind of the data scientist's perspective. This is kind of classic accuracy measures and when to use them, how to be careful about this. And then in the second part, I wanna kind of look at model quality much more from a software engineering perspective. What can things like test coverage, unit testing, performance testing. Is there something that we can learn, um, what, that we can apply to model testing here as well? And I have a longer discussion there and a, a couple of discussions where I also see that some, in some machine learning conferences, people kind of realize some of these test techniques, ad adopt techniques out of software engineering and specific angles to, to write tests for models. Um, just briefly to frame this, um, we're looking at systems that are really hard to test. So this is old quote, what makes testing hard? Programs which are written in order to determine um, the answers in the first place are hard to test. Uh, there would be no need to write such a program if we already knew the correct answer. Right, so machine learning, this is again this idea that we don't have specifications. If we know how to write the program, we wouldn't learn um, from data. and if we learn from data and we don't know what the right answer is, then how are we going to test this? So this is kind of a challenge that we see throughout again. And today I wanna to focus very narrowly on model quality. We're going to talk much more, we're going to zoom out, look at the entire system, I motivated this, and we're going to talk much more about uh, things like how do you test the pipeline? How do you deploy models? How do you make sure that the deployment is of good quality? How do you test in production and things like this? But today I wanna to focus narrowly on, on model quality, or model accuracy pretty much. So the idea here is that you have some model, and again, we discussed this, this is essentially a function, right? That takes some inputs, produces an output that we have learned. And we have some test data or validation data that kind of plays a role as tests. So we have some inputs and we have some expected outputs. We can compare them. And we kind of want to discuss somehow how good our model is for data, right? Um, there's a distinction here and I just wanna be careful that we're not confusing this. I don't wanna talk about the quality of the machine learning algorithm. So let's say I don't wanna test the decision tree algorithm. I assume this is co implemented correctly. We actually have specifications of how 
um, that works, how decision trees should work, how um, deep neural network, the learning strategy should work, and we could write unit tests for that, right? So this is kind of classic testing. Uh, I care about the model. I also don't care about data quality today or the system quality where we look at the entire system, right? So when I talk about model quality and we have this cancer example again, where we want to predict whether in a scanned, um, a CT scan or something like this, there's cancer that a physician should look at, right? I wanna see how often is this model correctly predicting that there's cancer in there? How good is this model at this specific task, right? Really just this model part. And in practice, you would put the cancer prediction probably in a larger medical system, healthcare system. This is just an open source uh, new hospital kind of thing. Um, new health, I think. Um, so that I have a screenshot, but in general, this would be part of a larger system, right? Do you think about user interaction, how somebody interacts with the model? I don't care about this today. Also, there are typically many qualities that we can care about. Like, and we'll talk more about this, like the model size, how long it takes to make a prediction, which is the inference time, um, how we are interacting with the user, what kind of mistakes we are making, um, how, to, how the system deals with mistakes. Again, I'm not caring about any of this today. I'm narrowly focusing on the quality of the mo model predictions themselves, right? And both in the first part of the lecture and then the second part of the lecture. So why would you want to do this? Mostly to compare models. You want to see whether mo one model is better than another model or whether one model is good enough for a certain task, right? Um, and there are a couple of more nuanced questions that we can ask. Um, how does a model, and some are less direct, um, how does it support the system goals or which kind of mistakes does a model make? But in general, we want to see how well um, do models predict things. One more thing, so I have a couple of slides on terminology. Um, this is often when kind of at least my intuitive terminology on kind of from a software engineering perspective doesn't align with how data scientists talk about things. And I'm, I was for a long time always confused. I'm, it's still tripping me up when I read in a machine learning paper that people talk about performance. When you hear data scientists talk about performance, they always, almost always mean model accuracy, right? So they say a model performs better if it predicts things better. From my perspective, performance is much more, I, I think of execution time, but that's maybe just my background. Um, this is something that uh, they would call inference time or learning time, right? So kind of execution time typically has uh, different, uh, different names here, or they might talk about latency here. Um, so when somebody says this model performs better than another model, they probably talk about prediction accuracy. If you're not sure, you might wanna ask them what they mean by performance. And when I pointed this out kind of in a passive aggressive way to uh, kind of machine learning researcher that this performance term is kind of weird from my perspective, they rightfully so said, yeah, performance, everybody uses performance in a different way, right? So performance in art has a different name in or in in business, job performance is how well somebody does a job, right? It doesn't have to do with execution time. Company performance is a typical um, indicator. So this, this term is overloaded anyway. I uh, just wanna make this aware. All right, with all of this out of the way, I wanna start with prediction accuracy. So this is kind of the classic view how you evaluate um, performance or accuracy of a model, right? So this is what a machine learning course would typically teach about how you evaluate accuracy. Now, I already mentioned this. You, um, the basic idea is that you compare the expected outputs, if you have labeled data, with the thing that the model predicts. Right? So here's an example of a, um, of a matrix. Um, this is a classification task where we have three possible outputs. We know it's actually A, actually B, or actually C. Right, so this is what the ground truths, our test data, our validation data would tell us. And sometimes the model predicts A, sometimes it predicts B, and sometimes predicts C. And you can compare what is predicted versus what was expected. 
right? So this is often called a confusion matrix or an error matrix. Um, it's simple, simply just the comparison of predicted outcomes versus expected outcomes. And I think you see them with uh, X and Y axis swapped. Um, both of those I think are fairly common. I think the straightforward part here is um, that all the values on the diagonal are those values um, that are correctly predicted, right? So we have the, the model predicts A, it's actually A, we have 10 of those. The model predicts B, it's actually B, we have 24 of those. And the model predicts C, it's actually C, um, we have 82 of those. And all the other values, the model makes some mistake. Right? For example, in this case here, the model predicts A, but it's actually B, right? so it's a wrong prediction. And what accuracy in the basic sense for classification tasks just, uh, uh, does, it just compares all the cor correct predictions Right, so the sum of all the values on the diagonal by all the number of possible predictions. In this specific case, we would be 70% accurate or 71%, right? Because 71% of the values are on the diagonal line. This is like the baseline, the simplest value, uh, way of looking at accuracy. So with this, we get a result, right? So we get something like, 99% accurate, or in this case, 70% accurate. And that's a value that's very hard to interpret in itself. Right? It's similar if I tell you this, your web server uh, answers queries in half a second. Is this a good value or a bad value? This really depends on the problem. Right? So there are some problems where 99% is a really bad accuracy because you're producing a lot of wrong results. Um, um, the typical example is if you do HIV tests on the entire population, if you have, like HIV is very rare among the entire population and if one in a hundred people, you just tell them they have HIV, they have AIDS, um, they are not going to be happy with the diagnosis, right? So this, is, this produces a lot of panic in the entire uh, population. This would be a terrible prediction. On the other hand, there are tasks where 10% accuracy might be pretty good, right? So 10%, if Google gives you the right search result in the first hit 10% of the time, maybe you're happy with this, right? Um, there's some tasks that are just hard where you're willing to look at multiple results. So to interpret accuracy, um, A, you can look at the, the improvement in accuracy that you're doing, right? So you can look at, um, what's the accuracy of the previous best approach and how much better can I do? So it's improvement on accuracy or reduction of error. The formula is here. It's essentially just comparing the old accuracy and the new accuracy and giving you a percentage and how much you're improving. So that's something that's much better to interpret, right? So if I'm telling you um, your model does 20% better than the old model, that's easier to interpret. Still not clear whether it's getting you into a range that's actually useful, uh, it's a starting point. The other thing, and here's some pictures missing, but the other thing um, that's um, important or that's useful to know whether 90% is good or bad is thinking about baselines. Right, so a model accuracy in itself is not very useful, but if you know what a simple baseline, a simple heuristic, something that I could just try um, without a lot of effort would produce, I have a much better sense of how much I'm outperforming the baseline. So let's say, question for you, I wanna predict cancer in an image. I'm learning a classifier, I'm investing a lot of things into um, into training. What could be simple baselines? Something that you could implement without a lot of machine learning. Something simple that you can compare against. So either write or raise your hand, one of those. You wouldn't typically compare manual classification is you could compare against that, um, but it's a very expensive baseline, right? So it's, it's hard to automate. I, I'm more thinking about heuristics, something that you could implement. Um, 
So what do you mean by guessing? Like, um, if it's a binary task, then 50% is a reasonable baseline. So just random, <laughs> randomly guessing, right? Right, flipping a coin, right? That's a that's a perfectly fine baseline that you compare against. Just randomly say there's cancer or not. Um, Vivek, what do you mean by equals zero? I mean like uh, basically saying there is no cancer for everything. Yeah, you can say for every image there is no cancer, which probably does better than um, random guessing, because most images probably won't have cancer. So if that thing alone is like 90% accurate, then 91% accuracy is maybe not very impressive. Right? Um, right, Daniel says, if you, if you know the baseline, what's the basic assumption of how many people have cancer in the general population, you, could, you can adjust your guesses maybe. Um, at least you can guess a more frequent result. Um, there are also things where you can actually look at the image maybe do something like, is there any dark spot somewhere in an image? That's something that you can probably do without machine learning, something where you just briefly implement, are there like six pixels together that are darker than the surrounding area, right? That's something that you could probably implement. Um, so a couple of things like this um, are possible baselines. What about recidivism? So this is a mod, uh, the example where you're guessing whether somebody who's in, in jail right now should be released um, or whether they are, so you're asking whether they are likely to commit another criminal offense in the next two years. What could be a baseline for this? Again, it's a, re, it's a um, classification task, yes, no. Um, what could you do there? You could just look at the number of uh, past uh, offenses. Yes, you could try something. The first thing is, again, you can guess, of course. You can always say always release or never release. Right? You can look at the number of past offenses and just have a cutoff. Um, maybe you have some data that you can look at and find the right cutoff, right? So essentially build a classifier that's super trivial, that just looks at one feature at a time, right? Um, Number of uh, years served is another example that would probably work, right? So those kind of things are, are probably plausible. Um, so, and by doing this, you have a much better chance of interpreting a number like 99%, right? Because you know what simple approaches can already do. There are way more things to, to narrow down what kind of mistakes you're doing. The first common thing that people do is in binary classification tasks, distinguish false positives from false negatives. Right? So there's the example, if you're predicting, let's say you're predicting cancer again, right? So if you're correctly predicting cancer, that's a true positive. If you're correctly predicting that there is no cancer in the image, that's a true negative. If you're predicting that there's a cancer, but the patient actually doesn't have cancer, right? Or doctors would disagree when they look at this, that's a false positive. As a consequence that you're potentially scaring the patients, right? Or giving more work to the doctor. And the opposite is a false negative, where you predict that there is no cancer, but the patient actually has cancer. Right, or a doctor would disagree with you, a physician would disagree and say there's cancer in this image. And this has a consequence um, that this cancer would go undetected potentially. So the point here is that um, false positives and false negatives are not necessarily equally good or equally bad. In the cancer example, what would you say? What's more important? Well, actually, have a I can just use, uh, give me a second, I have a quiz for this. Um, what do you think is more, uh, more problematic? What problem is worse? Producing a false positive or false negative or you have no idea? All right, let me just share results so far. Um, 
Can somebody argue for why false negatives are worse? A lot of you said this. Hmm? Uh, I can go. Um, like my rationale was, uh, since it's related to the health of a patient, if you are missing a warning, it could be life dangerous for the person. Right. And you could argue that the false positive, maybe you have another check before you tell the patient, right? So you this immediately. Um, so it's maybe more, more difficult to kind of produce complacency because somebody doesn't check the scan rather than check the probable cases. Um, I think that's an argument. Um, is there somebody who wants to argue why false positives might be worse? Yeah, I can. Um, uh, okay, so I'll go. Um, so maybe maybe not for disease detecting, but let's say uh, predicting earthquakes or tsunamis. Uh, in this case, we have a false positive, then uh, it will cause unnecessary panic and chaos. Yeah. So, so I mean, for this, uh, we can go through other examples, but in, in this specific example, when would a, is there a case where you would consider a false positive to be worse? Uh, Chris, you had a? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess uh, you would, like if you start treating it, right, and you, uh, you know, spend the resources to start treating something that isn't actually there. Um, you know. Yeah, if you- I don't know if it's objectively worse, but. <laughs> Still yeah, if, if you start chemotherapy for somebody who doesn't have cancer, if, if you don't have any additional checks in there, that probably also be pretty bad. Uh, Mahin? Uh, yeah, so uh, my thought was just around if there's too many false positives, um, the uh, doctors or uh, other people responsible might just start, start ignoring the warnings. Yeah. And that'll just spoil the, this thing of the system. Right. So I don't want to give in, def oh, Jake, another comment? Oh, yeah, just quickly, um, there was an article on The Verge discussing this. And, and basically, I think the problem was the, uh, the AI systems were detecting tumors, mm -hmm. um, which was, it was doing well at detecting tumors, but it turned out that a lot of the tumors wouldn't get any worse or turn into like a malignant cancer mm -hmm. or a life-threatening cancer. So um, yeah, it, it's kind of like the other guys were saying, like it could actually be, worse trying to do chemo or, um, or trying to, to do something radical because the cancer is not a threat. Right. So in a couple of cases, I think there's a discussion here whether it's actually the model is, is poor or the way that we are mod we're using the model is not great, right? So uh, the decision whether we start chemo is probably not directly linked to the model outcome. Um, and we probably want to think about how are physicians involved or somebody checking this and so on. Um, I don't want to make a definitive answer for this specific case. Um, just skip a second. Um, uh, but we could do this and I don't want to, I think I don't want to go through this. Um, we could do this for different examples and we might come up with different conclusions whether we should emphasize uh, for its positives or for its negatives, what's worse, right? Um, so there, there are some things where it may not matter really, like suggesting products to buy on an e-commerce site. If you predict something wrong, unless it's, if it's not completely offensive, it's probably fine. And if you're missing a sale, that's maybe more of a problem. And then there are examples where if you accuse somebody of human trafficking at the border, that's maybe not the best thing, but maybe also missing. So there are all these trade-offs, right? Um, and if you only look at accuracy, if you don't look at false positives, false negatives separately, you wouldn't see this distinction actually. There are examples here. Um, here's a cancer predictor where you look at the baseline probability. So assume you're testing just random people and you would typically expect uh, one in 2000 people have cancer. If you just if you don't look at people who come into the can, uh, hospital, then it's more likely to have cancer, right? Um, a random predictor wouldn't do very well, but a baseline predictor that always says you have never cancer, right? That just goes with a more frequent option would do actually really well in terms of uh, accuracy, right? Uh, if you look at the diagonal, almost all the results are on the diagonal. 
The problem is just you, you miss all the cancer cases, right? So this is kind of useless, even though it's very accurate. Whereas a random thing is very inaccurate. It doesn't find a lot of cancer and produces a lot of warnings, right? Um, the terms that we're using here typically are recall and precision. Um, let me go back a few slides. Um, recall and precision are defined in terms of false positives and negatives. Um, the intuition is that recall is out of all the actual cancer cases, how many are we finding? Right? So out of all the, um, if you combine the, the cases where there's cancer, how many of those do we find? So what's the true positive? over the true positives and the false negatives, right? Over the cases that we find and the cases that we don't find. And the um, precision is typically looking at, um, of all the predictions that we are making, how many of those are correct predictions, right? So if the system tells us there are 5,000 cases with cancer and we look at them and only five of them have cancer, then we have a very low precision, right? It essentially means if you're looking through cases one by one at warnings, how often will you find a true case? And there are a couple of others, false negative rates, false positive rates, and kind of the harmonic mean between them. So you see those a lot discussed kind of in machine learning literature. They are always, com they are always um, explained in terms of these, um, these matrices. Um, all of these things are only defined for pairwise classification though, right? So recall and precision are always defined if you have a true case and a false case. You're predicting true or false, right? Um, you need to have some, like it's no longer predicting A, B, and C. It's predicting A or not A, because I need to distinguish what's a true positive and what's a true negative, right? I need to have a notion of positive and negative. If you have a multi-class problem, like you're predicting ABC, you can turn this into a yes, no problem by looking at one attribute at a time, right? Instead of looking at ABC, you're asking, is it A or is it not A? Or you're asking, is it B or is it not B? So in this specific example here, I, I drew this before where um, this is the original three class prediction problem. And if I'm only asking whether I'm predicting A, right, I'm predicting A correctly in 10 cases. It's A, but uh, I predict A, but it's actually not A. It's in eight cases, these two, right? I don't distinguish this further. And then there are the cases where I predict that it's not A. So anything in these two columns, and I can check out of those cases where I predict it's not A, it's actually not A in a lot of cases, and I hope this is correct. Yeah, um, in these two cases, it's um, in these three cases and in these five cases, it's actually A, but I predicted something wrong. Does this make sense? It's just important for you, because we're talking about so many different uh, prediction problems. If you have a multi-class prediction problem, like you're predicting which number is in an image, you can't define recall and precision, right? You can only define recall and precision for, am I detecting the number zero correctly, right? You need a binary classification problem for this. All right, there are a couple of visualizations. If you dig into this, if recall and precisions are unintuitive, there's a lot of help, um, but that's, uh, that's roughly the, the approach that I'm going for. Um, does this make sense so far? Recall and precision roughly clear? Any questions? The next step is that a lot of classifiers don't just tell you A or not A. They don't give you a binary answer, but they typically give you a probability or, or a number that doesn't necessarily mean precisely a probability, but it gives you something more likely A, more likely not A, or something like this, right? So a lot of classification tasks will actually give you a value between zero and one. And one's mean, one means cancer, zero means not cancer, and anything in between means something like this. If you have this kind of outcome and you, you want to 
report cancer or not, you kind of need to define a threshold, right? You need to figure out if the system reports more than 0.5, I'm going to report cancer, or if it reports more than 0.8, I'm going to report cancer. If it reports, if the system is very, very confident at 0.95, then I'm going to report cancer. And you can see if, so if you're moving the threshold, this would affect how you're sorting the predictions into rows, right? If you have a low threshold, then you're predicting A more frequently. If you have a very high threshold, then you're predicting not A more frequently. And this will affect recall and precision. Typically, the higher you set your threshold, the worse your recall gets, right? There are, few, there are fewer and fewer cases that are reported as cancer. So also of the true cancer cases, you will probably see fewer cancer um, cases in general, right? So typically, let me see if I can do this now. So, uh, so if you have a plot, um, what you would typically expect is that um, if you start at, you classify everything at zero, right? So this is your threshold. You would expect that recall is perfect at one, right? You classify everything at cancer, so you find all the cancer. It's a useless predictor, but you find all the cancer. And then the higher you, you use the threshold, the lower your recall rate goes, right? So this would be recall. At, at the opposite side, when you're saying everything is cancer, then your predict, uh, precision is probably not that great. It depends a little bit on how many cancer cases you have. But the more restrictive you are, like you're only reporting cases where you're pretty certain that they're cancer, typically your precision goes up. And where you want to be on this trade-off, so whether you want to be somewhere on this end where you have high recall but low precision, or you want to be in a place where you have very high precision but low recall, depends a lot on how you want to use the classifier. Right? So picking a right threshold can navigate you along this trade-off of recall uh, and precision typically. Make sense? If you plot them, so, okay. One more thing, one problem that you're having is if you want to compare two models, you can just look at their accuracy, right? So you can look, model A has higher accuracy than model B. Or you can look at uh, recall is higher, precision is a bit lower, but you can still decide which one of those is better potentially. If you have different thresholds, now it becomes more challenging to compare models because am I comparing them at the same threshold? Am I comparing them at different thresholds? How am I doing the comparison? The thing that people often do to sidestep this question at all is they essentially figure out, can we do a comparison at all possible thresholds? And this is where you get to these measures of area under the curve, which if you've taken a machine learning class, you probably have seen before. Um, so the idea here is you have precision on one axis, and you have recall on the other axis, and you're just plotting the value at all possible thresholds, right? So here are two algorithms or two, two models. One model has very high precision at re with the recall 0.3. This has a lower precision at the same recall and so on. And typically the model that is better across all thresholds will be closer to this corner of the graph. Right, so the, let me see, the further out you go, the better. And the way that this is typically done is to measure the area under the curve. This is where the term comes from. And the higher value that you get, the better it is. Again, by doing this, you're summarizing all the precision recall values across all possible thresholds. This may or may not be exactly what you want. Maybe you don't care about all thresholds, but you often have a behavior like this where you see that one, um, one model consistently performs better than the other. It's consistently further out. It doesn't have to be. It can also be something where you see something like this, where it's sometimes better, sometimes worse, right? But area under the curve compares this. 
The, the metric that's more frequently used than this is the receiving operator characteristic curve, ROC curve. Um, it's almost the same, except that it technically plots two different values. It tr plots the true positive rate and the false positive rate. Uh, they can be derived in similar ways. It has almost the same meaning. It just looks a little bit different. And again, you, you prefer the approaches that are fur further into now into this corner is better, right? So the more area under the curve, the better. Make sense? Any questions? Just wanna show you where those, where those um, things come from. There are a couple of additional measures here. Um, like lift break even point, log loss, um, coins kappa, and so on. So if you're actually doing an evaluation of a classification problem, it's worth thinking about which metric to use, right? Accuracy is very blind, uh, but works with n-class problems or multi-classification problems. Recall and precision gives you a bit more insights into false positives versus false negatives. Area under the curve is useful if you have a threshold. And then there are a couple of more um, that you can look up if you're interested. By doing this, we have only looked at classification problems so far. We haven't, um, there's a question, what do we do if we actually have regression tasks? Right, so let's take the housing example again, where we have um, some information and we're predicting a price and we know the actual price, right? So how would a Plus, uh, how would a confusion matrix look like? Do you have an idea, Vivek? No, I had a question. Okay, go. go uh, so for uh, always the graphs for precision and recall, it seems like as recall increases, precision comes down. Typically, yes. Yeah, so I'm just trying to understand the rational behind it. Like, okay. Why does that happen? So. Go back to the cancer prediction thing, right? So the, the, maybe the extreme cases are the most obvious. So if you're starting at threshold zero, oops. hey, no, I uh, can't write apparently anymore. Um, if, if you're starting at threshold zero, you're saying everything is cancer, hmm. right? So every prediction, in, even if it's with the lowest confidence, right? Even if the confidence of the model is really, really low, you just say it's cancer. By doing this, you have a perfect recall because every image that ever contains cancer, you're predicting as cancer, but you're also predicting all the other images as cancer. So, you pre, uh, so your precision is pretty bad. Yes. Right, so this is why on the left-hand side, you have great recall, but you have terrible precision. Hmm. On the other hand of the spectrum, you're essentially predicting nothing as cancer, only the cases where you're super confident, right? So your precision mm -hmm. is very high, unless your model is completely garbage, right? But if your model is somewhat reasonable, the high precision, case, uh, the high probability cases are actually cancer, then you're reporting very few cases, but those are probably actually cancer. Right, so your precision is probably pretty decent, but you're only reporting very, very few cases, only the ones where you're really certain. So you're probably dismissing a bunch of cases which are cancer, but you, you're not entirely sure. Okay. But like it can also happen that both of them increase with time. I, because like, on the left-hand side of the spectrum, we are saying recall is zero. So I have not identified anything, but my precision is high. Right. So uh, another way to think about this is if you look at all the predictions in your test data, um, uh, you can sort them all, right? From the most probable to the least probable. Mm -hmm. And what the threshold is, it will split the data set somewhere in the middle. It will not resort mm -hmm. them, right? So it's always mm -hmm. the most probable is always in, in one set and the least probable always in the other set. But mm -hmm. you, you shuffle how many predictions are you making, right? Are you, uh, if there are 
a thousand patients, are you making one cancer diagnosis or 10 or 20, mm -hmm. independent of how many there are? Right? So this is why you tend to see this trend over time. Okay, I got it. Thanks. Right. All right, back to this case. Um, I have another question. Go for it. Yeah, can can go back to uh, last slide. Yep. Yeah, so I'm just um, getting a little bit confused about um, the definition here. So you says um, we are using a threshold to make decision, mm -hmm. right? But um, I believe that the model uh, has to actually be able to make decisions. Like in the table, it says the model predicts A or not A, right? So I think here we are actually using a threshold to select the model um, rather than to make a decision. Am I understanding it correctly? So the, the table that I show here is based on a specific threshold, right? So this is one example of an outcome table. And if I pick a different threshold, some of the results from the lower row will move into the higher row or, or down. The, it's always the same model, right? So the same, the model will always predict 0 0.8, 0 0.9 for specific pictures. But whether I consider this as cancer or not cancer, my interpretation of the model outcome, that will change. Mm. So the model yeah. itself doesn't change. The, mo the model predicts a number, but how I interpret that number will change based on my threshold. Um, yeah. I see. In some machine learning approaches, you don't deal with thresholds. It will just make a prediction for you. They may use thresholds internally. Um, so a bunch of approaches will just always return true or false instead of a number. Then you don't have this issue. Right? But if you are making a decision based on the threshold, then you have this issue. Right. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, got it. Any other questions? All right, let me speed up a bit maybe. Um, so if you're looking at numbers, it's kind of hard to even think about what a confusion matrix might look like. You can contain, you can put stuff into buckets where you say everything between zero and a hundred thousand dollars is in one bucket and a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars is in the second bucket and so on. And if you do this, you can just, you have again, you turn the regression problem into a classification problem, right? So you're just asking, have I predicted the value in the right bucket? And then you could use accuracy, right? like the traditional accuracy or recall and precision. But usually these things don't make sense. This is not the kind of thing that we really want to do. So typically you want to ask much more, how close are the outcomes to the actual values? So here you use a different class of um, accuracy metrics. One common one is a mean absolute percentage error. So this is just essentially asking for every single prediction, how many percent am I off of the expected value, right? So in this case, for example, I'm predicting 230, but it's actually 250. So I'm off by 20 and 20 out of 250 is a certain percentage, right? So I'm about 10% off here. And then you do this for every row, you figure out how many percent are you off. Here I'm almost accurate, I'm only slightly off, right? So it's just, it's half a percent off roughly. And then you just compute the average of all those percentages. This is one of the accuracy metrics. There are many different ones, right? But this tells you, um, the metric here in the end tells you, on average, I'm 5% off in every prediction. Does it make sense? So be careful whether you have a classification or prediction problem that you use the right metric. Um, and again, you wanna compare against baselines. So, let me, let me just ask again for the housing problem. Um, I want to do the housing price prediction. What could be a baseline that you're comparing against?
You can do the average house cost, right? Um, you can do the average house cost within the neighborhood. This is probably very cheap to compute. Um, priced by the number of windows, yeah, you could kind of do a very simple regression model yourself. Um, compute cost by square footage, that's maybe better than by window, um, but it's a similar idea, right? So all of these things are typical predictions that you can easily do and use as baseline. And then again, you can check how much do you pr improve over the error of your baseline approach, right? This is much easier um, to understand. Again, there are a couple of different metrics here. I don't want to go through them in detail. Uh, the mean absolute error is looking how much am I off on average in absolute terms. So instead of saying on average I'm off by 5%, it's saying on average I'm off by $20,000 in this case, right? There's, you can do this with squared errors, with root squared errors, um, and R square metrics, and there are a couple of others, and they have certain trade offs of how sensitive they are to outliers and things like this. Um, and you find more discussions of what's appropriate if you want to look at this. There are also more specific things in term, if you do sort of ranking problems. Um, if you have ranking problems, you care about the top. Uh, predictions more than the lower ones. So what people typically do is look at things like mean average precision, where they look at, I get a bunch of recommendations. How good is the first recommendations? Or how good are the first three recommendations? Right, so um, mean average precision looks at how many good results do I have in the first K rows? So if I look at MAP1, I get one good result out of one prediction, perfect um, accuracy at this level, right? And you can do this average across multiple queries. If I look at the first two, I have 50% uh, mean av or average precision on this thing, right? Among the first two, it's 0.3 among the first four, uh, 0.5, uh, 3.5 among the first four and so on, right? And you just, average this across a bunch of different things. And again, you want some baseline for the prediction for the ranking and so on. Um, and again, there are more specialized ranking measures and I don't really want to go into detail. And if you look into any specific field, um, I'm taking natural language processing here as an example. It completely depends on what you're doing. You may solve a ranking problem. You may solve a classification problem. You may solve, um, you may want to have some evaluation where you're actually looking at translated text how, or te voice recognition, how long, the, how good the entire sequence are. So there are a couple of things where you just classify text. If you just want to see whether the text has a, con a positive or negative sentiment, you can turn this into a yes, no question and use recall and precision, right? If you want to determine the truth of a statement, again, uh, recall and precision. If you look at translation or summarization, you typically compare against what a human would do and then look at some sort of similarity metrics, like how similar is the sequence of things that the computer produces to the things that I'm producing and so on, right? All right. Any questions on kind of, this was the first part of the lecture, kind of the data scientist perspective. Any questions on those? With this, I wanna go on to software testing. Right, so software testing is something that I hope everybody in the uh, virtual room is familiar with, at least to some degree. The idea is really just, you have a program with a specification and the test has three parts. It has the call and the test inputs. It has some expected outputs and it's executed in some environment that we control, right? So like a specific machine. So a typical test might look something like this. You have a call with some inputs and you have some expected outputs and I'm running this in some environment like on a cloud service or with some Java around this. There's a problem here that we're discussing in a second is how do we know what the expected output is for a test? This can be very tedious to produce. And in general, testing is um, not sound. 
So you don't, you, you can't expect to find all the bugs with testing. You can find some bugs, and if you find a bug, it's, if, if a test case fails, uh, you can assume something is wrong in the program, right? You're not over approximating. Um, but you can only look at the things that you're actually executing, not at the things that you're not executing. Uh, the layout is completely broken. Okay, think again of, can we use testing the same way for machine learning models, right? So let's assume this is supposed to be a table again for housing prices, right? So we have the predicted housing prices and the actual housing prices. And what we could do is we could take our data and turn it into something like this, where we say, if you predict for these inputs, I expect that the output should be equal to $25,000, right? So I could essentially turn my data table and turn it into tests, but that kind of seems weird, right? Because this was already fail, the test suite would always fail pretty much, right? It would fail already on the first row here because the actual, pre the prediction that we got on the first row is, was previously off by $20,000, right? So it's not exactly uh, $250,000, so the test suite fails. We don't really expect that the model predicts exactly the right number in our training data. Right? We even have the cases, um, let's see, I don't have this here, uh, but we even had the cases when we talked about uh, classification trees that we might not even be able to distinguish all the training data, right? Because in our training set for exactly the same features, we see different outcomes. So we wouldn't, even, even with the most overfitting, we wouldn't be able to, to produce exactly the right outcomes here. So, Software testing, at least in this sense, is not a great analogy, right? So it's not that every single row in our validation set is a single test case. And we're coming back to this idea that we have an Oracle problem. Um, if you've seen, like, some of you were in my class last semester, we talked about this at, at some way, to some more extent. The Oracle problem is always when you're, gen, when you're writing test cases, how do you know what the expected outcome is, right? So I wanna know, or I wanna test the factoring prime numbers in some way, for example. Right? I can easily produce inputs. I can try one, five, any random numbers input, but how do I know what the expected output is if I run to write a test? This is a fundamental problem in testing that the finding oracles, finding the expected outcome is hard, right? And if we think of validation sets, we always have the right answer there. But in traditional testing, this is often hard. So what we do when we write unit tests is we as humans typically think about what do we expect as an outcome. So it's a manual oracle. We write this manually. Right, so in, in, this, oops, in this case here, I am writing that when I'm adding two plus two, I'm expecting four, right? So I'm doing the math of the, based on the specification of what I expect the program to do in my head. In this case, it's easy. Uh, and I'm writing the expected output there. If I want to kind of generate lots of, lots of test cases, maybe randomly, this doesn't work. I don't want to ask a person, here I've generated all these numbers to test additions. Can you just compute in your head what the expected answer is for all of them, right? That's super expensive. Um, it's something that we often do, but it's something that we can't automate, right? So we can't automatically generate test cases. A trick that we can sometimes use, and it depends on the environment, is to use a gold standard. So if we already have a different implementation of the system, this is typically a very slow implementation um, that we're sure is correct. Maybe we have some machine readable specifications. Um, then we can just compare, we, we, have an, we have a test input and we can use a slow implementation to figure out what the expected output is supposed to be. 
Differential testing is a nice example here. So this has been used, for example, to test compilers a lot, um, where you have multiple implementations of a C compiler, and you just run the same C code through multiple compilers and then run the program and see whether they agree afterward. And if they don't agree, either you know that one compiler is more correct than the others or you just do voting. Jake? Hey, so um, specific to the, the factoring example, um, I was thinking that um, you know, it's, a, it's kind of an invertible operation so that if we had the factors and we were able to confirm that the factors were prime, we could multiply them together and get that number. And whereas I could see that wouldn't transfer very well to a lot of machine learning problems, I was wondering, is there a, a broader category for something that's invertible like that for testing? Um, I have a slide at the very end that this is actually something what you're talking about that sometimes works in machine learning. This is used for testing vision systems when you have a good simulator where you have a way um, if you have a scene it's easier to go from a scene in a simulator to an image and it's going from an image back to the scene right so you can put a pedestrian inside the scene in the simulator and then render an image with a pedestrian and then check whether the vision system recognizes a pedestrian. So if you control the entire thing, there's actually sometimes this dual where you, where you have a easier implement, where you can do the inverse of the machine learning task easily. Um, but again, this is special cases. Maybe the prime example is not great here, right? So, so for addition, for example, uh, this might not work, but yeah, um, I think what you're talking about here is again having, no, it's actually not in the list. Uh, if you go from the result to the inputs, right? So you can create a random result and then create uh, corresponding inputs. Um, I think this is actually, I haven't seen this much in the software testing literature. I see this actually more in the machine learning world with simulation. Um, it's interesting. Um, Something that people do a lot, so, so comparison against the gold standard is nice if you have one. The problem with machine learning is that we're solving problems that we don't know how to solve otherwise, so we don't usually have a gold standard, right? Um, we can manually ask people to do this, but then we're back at manually constructing output-input pairs. Um, what people do often in automated testing is checking global properties. So you're not checking the correctness of the entire system. You're just checking things like whatever input I'm giving it, it should not crash, right? So this is known as fast testing sometimes. So this was very effective like 20, 30 years ago where you can just feed Unix utilities arbitrary byte strings and they would often crash. Um, so they've done this a lot. This is hardened, this, this doesn't crash systems, but there are more smarter ways of generating random inputs. And they usually look for things like, can we crash the system? And sometimes you have some partial specifications where you maybe have a tool that can check for detect buffer overflows. So you're generating inputs to see whether you can create buffer overflows. Or you have, you're trying to generate inputs that time out the system, right? So that kind of create very long run times. Uh, there are smart fuzzers that do this. Um, and the last part is writing manual assertions. Um, so if you know partial behavior like preconditions, postconditions in a method, you can write, just write assert statements. And then you're essentially turning these assertions into crashes and can again use techniques where you try to crash the program or not crash the program, right? What I want to emphasize here, and I hope I get there today is um, that if you have certain invariants that hold for all possible executions, you can do random testing much better. But that's kind of how far we can push this typically with the Oracle problem, right? So we can't, unless we have a gold standard or machine readable specification, we can't really generate random input output pairs generally. So here's a bunch of about fuzzing that I just told you about. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, labeled input data is not really solving the Oracle problem, right? It gives us some examples of expected outcomes, but we're not technically expecting exactly those values, 
right? It, what we really want to measure is can we kind of generalize from training data, not can we produce these exact values for certain outputs, right? If we, if we achieve slightly different values that are close enough, we're still happy, right? We're much, much more interested in getting near those values and kind of making statements across multiple data points, not that every row is a test case and none of them should fail, right? This is not the right analogy. So we're not predicting that they are all correct. Um, a single wrong prediction is not a bug. Um, another question that we can ask is something like performance testing, maybe a better analogy, right? So with performance testing, we are not expecting, so we want to see, for example, that we're, we can run a server and the answer should usually be below half a second, right? So we're not running the thing measuring performance and say it must be exactly 0.5 seconds. We're probably also not failing this if it's once below 0.5 seconds, right? We have some noise, we can accept some noise. We want to kind of make statements about multiple executions. What do you think? Is this a reasonable analogy? Does this make sense? A yes vote, okay. I think it's certainly a better way to think about this. I'm not sure that I'm really convinced. There are some things that seem somewhat similar, um, right? So I mentioned they are not precise. We need to control the hardware and so on. And we typically look at multiple inputs, not just one, right? So it's kind of similar in that sense. And it's also similar that we don't have real specifications, but I we may have some expectations of where we should be. And I think we can do some regression tests uh, where we can say with performance, we would say across multiple executions and multiple different inputs, we would expect an average of below 0.5. So maybe we can think of something um, that we say across all these data points in my validation set, we expect an accuracy roughly larger than 0.99 or something like this. I think you could do this um, with performance testing. You also have some of those problems that the numbers themselves don't matter so much, but kind of tracking this over time, tracking performance results over time, that makes sense. Um, so I don't think it's the worst analogy. Um, I'm not convinced that the single test would be the same, right? But if you kind of think about multiple executions compared to maybe multiple different inputs, maybe you get somewhat closer. All right, this sounds more positive than I originally was when I was creating this slide. I think it's not the worst analogy. I, I don't think it's a perfect match. Um, I wanna take a quick detour, and this is kind of my pet th theory these days. I spent um, earlier this year where, we, where I could still travel, I, I, spent, I went to a workshop that had both data scientists and software engineers in them talking about kind of quality assurance and building these systems. And we had long discussions of what is a machine learning bug, right? So if there's a bug, if the model doesn't perform well, would we, call, would we say that the model is buggy? Is the data that buggy? Is a single result buggy? I've already talked about, right? When a single result is off, we wouldn't call this as a bug, right? We, we kind of would go on with this. And this is really weird. And over a lot of discussion, and it's actually the, the bunch of feedback loops. So if you, if you look at some results, you might actually detect that a lot of results are not very good, but you might learn from this and improve your, improve your models. So you have some iteration there. And we came to an interesting discussion here that I think when we're talking about quality assurance of a model, so this is not the right analogy either, but it's a different mindset that might lead us to think about this in a different way, is thinking about the difference between validation and verification. 
So people in the MSE program have definitely seen this before. Others, hopefully, yes. Um, we can think about the difference as verification is given a specification, have we implemented the system correctly? Right? So think about you making a contract with your customer about what the system should be implemented. Verification, where most of the testing is, um, is just checking, do we have bugs in the system? Have we implemented this correctly, right? as specified? We might implement a system as specified, but it's completely useless because the specification was bad. That's typically a validation problem, right? So the, the distinction that people often uh, quote is, have we built the right system versus have we built the system right, right? So have we correctly implement what we were supposed to implement it, to, to implement, or have we implemented the right thing? Have we, do we have the right specification in a sense? Right. So the upper part is typically requirements engineering. So what we're typically doing is we're talking to people about what they want. We might interview them. We come up with requirements. And then there are lots of techniques to figure out once we write down those requirements, are they consistent? Are they the things that the customer wants? We might build a prototype and check this with the customer, whether that's what they want. That's a different activity than checking whether we coded the prototype correctly according to our specification, right? So most testing is, or pretty much all testing is a verification activity. When I teach the software testing class in the master's program, we always assume somebody gives us a specification and we don't question the specification typically, right? So there's a requirements engineering class where, we, where they worry about this and I don't care. The interesting part for me is the discussion where machine learning fits into this. And let's look at a single example here. This is a recidivism model. This is, we will talk about this later, but this is roughly equivalent or has a similar accuracy to the model that's actually used in court these days um, deciding whether to release somebody on bail. It's really simple in the end what the model really does if you boil it down to. It's essentially a decision tree checking the age and maybe the gender, but you can leave this out. And then you predict that you will arrest them again within two days. And if it's a different age and a certain number of uh, prior offenses, then you also predict arrest, otherwise you don't, right? So a very simple decision tree here. Think of this as a model. Now taking this model and implementing this in Java code is straightforward. Typically we wouldn't do this because we would just generate this, right? So we don't, if we assume that the model here, the machine learning thing, uh, sorry, I should go, go a step for earlier here. Um, the hypothesis that I'm trying to post here is that the machine learning model is equivalent to a specification. Going from the machine learning model to some implementation, that's trivial. The hard part is, is the model that we are learning, does this make sense for the people who are interested in this? Are we learning the right model, not are we implementing the model correctly? Right, so the question that we are asking here is, is this model really what we want as a society that's best at capturing whether somebody will actually commit a crime again, right? So we're trying to figure this out. It's not so much whether we have implemented this model correctly. So my hypothesis is that machine learning is really very similar to requirements engineering. Requirements engineers go out and interview people and synthesize something and come up with essentially a model, an idea. Uh, we could interview a bunch of judges about their experience and when should, when should we predict some, that somebody will commit a crime again? And instead of asking people, we're looking at data, right? Based on data, we're coming up with a model and kind of implementing that model, that's easy. That's why we don't really talk about bugs. What we really should talk about is whether that model is a good fit to what we want. Right? And this is why the, the questions that we are asking are different. It's not whether a test case fails, 
right? But it's whether we have the right model in the first place. Um, and another thing that you see in a second, now I run out of time, is that you may have some specifications and you want to check whether the model is consistent with some other specifications. For example, you have some fairness requirements. The model must not look at race or the model must not look at gender. And then you can compare whether they are consistent. And that's again, something that requirements engineers may do. They have tools for this where they check consistencies among multiple specifications. And suddenly, if you, if you look at this, also a lot of these feedback loops make sense because you might learn a model and you might evaluate its accuracy and figure out, oh, the model is maybe not the kind of making the kind of predictions that I want, right? It's not going in the right direction. So maybe it's not the right model. Maybe I need to go back and collect more data. Maybe my, it's similar to if you interview the wrong people, if the set of people that you interview is biased, you might come up with this wrong requirements, right? If you only interview, um, if you never interview the customer really, uh, only kind of other stakeholders, you might miss their point of view. I'm not sure that this is really solving any problems. To me, it makes clear why the, why the term machine learning bug doesn't make any sense to me, right? Because we're not talking about a bug in the verification sense we're talking about kind of we have the wrong model. In practice, I'm not sure that this is really that helpful though, because the main problem that we have is that most of the models that we learn, we can't understand, right? If you learn a deep neural network, it does something, but we can't really inspect it and can really make sure. There are still some techniques where we can figure out um, that they are consistent with some other specifications. Now we'll talk about this, right? But the testing philosophy is maybe not, not immediately the right thing. Um, so the question that we are really asking is, does a model, is the accuracy good enough to meet a user's specifications? Is a model compatible with some other specifications? Um, and it's not really an implementation problem. Does this make sense? It's the first time I'm trying this on a student audience. So what do you, what do you think? <laughs> All right, I take the one yes vote. Um, so in terms of terminology, um, I would suggest to avoid the term model bug. Right, so a model kind of saying that the model is buggy is problematic because what does it mean? It's wrong on this one input? Eh, not really, right? It's, it's kind of doing something generally bad. Well, it's, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do based on the training data that you give it. There's another view where we could say a model is never bad, it's just a wrong training data because a model is just derived from the training data. So a model is like, if we have a crash in a program, we're not, we're not blaming the program, uh, we're not blaming the binary, we're blaming the source code, right? In a sense, the model is derived with a machine learning approach from data. So the machine learning algorithm is somewhat similar to a compiler in that it just does with the data what we want it to do. So potentially we can blame it on the data, right? So we have, um, it just means that we have, um, um, what we're discussing here is really just that we have collected the wrong data over here. And I think that's a, that's a reasonable question, seeing do we have the right validation data, right? Or the right training data, actually not validation data. Um, that's another valid view, but again, the term machine learning bug, I think is problematic. Um, I think performance or accuracy are better terms because they better than correctness, right? So a model is not correct or not, but it's accurate or it performs well for certain expectations. And testing for prediction accuracy, you can draw analogies, but the direct testing analogy doesn't work. The performance testing analogy might work a little bit better. 
but it's still this this just brings in so many connotations right if you if you talk about software testing or testing in general you start thinking about coverage you start thinking about automated test case generation maybe about combinatorial testing equivalence classes things like this um, I have slides on a bunch of those. I'm running out of time, so I will cover this next week. Some of those things provide some inspiration, but most of the time we don't have a clear mapping. Like coverage is something that's super confusing. There are a couple of papers that talk about coverage of deep neural networks and things like this, like neuron coverage. It's super hard to even figure out whether that makes any sense at all. Um, because I think it's a wrong analogy, right? So we're, it's not implementing the model and then making sure that we have implemented it correctly. It's figuring out, do we have the right testing data to be co confident that the model does roughly what we want to do? All right. I have way more content talking about kind of analogies to testing, coverage, random testing, and CI. I'm going to do this next week. Um, maybe because I have three minutes left, um, Daniel, do, you sent me an email, um, a question by email. Maybe that's worth talking about that briefly for everybody. Sure. Yeah. Um, basically, my question was about how how do you compare models both like if you're doing using different algorithms or just type of parameter tuning and like if any statistical verification needs to needs to be done um, to, to compare the models. Yeah. So here's an example where I predict two models, right? One is a stupid model, but uh, one has 0.5 accuracy, the other one 0.99. Um, in this case, I think it's, obvious that one has way better accuracy than the other. I mean, this actually, this is a terrible example because all of these models are kind of bad. Um, but in some cases, you see very big differences between models, and it's clear that one is better than the other. Since there's a lot of de non-determinism in some model training, like some decision trees are deterministic, but if you go for random forest and so on, you have non-determinism. If you go for a deep neural network, it's all non-deterministic because you start with random values, right? So if you train a model repeatedly, you might get different results, slightly different accuracy results. You also do maybe k-fold cross-validation where you choose different splits. Um, it's actually possible that just by random chance, one model is slightly better on one training run than another model and so on, right? So that's something that you can handle with statistics. So if you have randomness in your training algorithm, you can just train the model repeatedly. You really don't wanna do this if you have a one week run of a deep neural network. So people don't typically do this much. Also, if you do k-fold cross-validation, you get different accuracy results and instead of just looking at the average, you could actually look with a statistical test whether they are consistently higher in one group than in the other group. My impression is that this is not typically done um, in papers and in practice, that people compare one accuracy in the, num in the end that's averaged over all, um, all the k-folds for example, right? And they tend to look at one single model. There are some articles, you pointed this out and I, I looked after this as well. So there are a couple of articles that look into how to do this. And there are some complications because if you do K-fold, they are not completely independent test runs because you're training on similar data and multiple runs and so on. So they often use kind of complicated statistics and so on. Um, so there are some people that think about this and I think if you want to be precise about this, you can, you can do statistical tests to see whether one model is better than another. But in practice, I think that's not very common. Here's also the, the other important thing is to look at how big is your improvement, right? So if you have a big effect size, like you go from 80% uh, to 90% accuracy, then you're pretty confident. But if you go from 91 uh, to 91.3, 
and that's kind of in your range of noise, then you kind of want to be more confident. But this is, I think, in the realm where you maybe win research papers, not where you really care about that the model that you're pushing into production is like a tiny bit better than the previous model. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thanks. I'm not expecting you to do anything like this in the homework assignment. So um, in the homework assignment, I'm asking you to kind of compare models and measure accuracy and pick, pick an accuracy measure, right? But you don't need to run statistical tests. But you're welcome to if you want to. <laughs> All right. I think this is a good place to end. Um, I've shown you different accuracy measures. I've started to talk about software testing. I'll continue there next week. Um, and I stop the recording here and then I stick around for questions as usual. <laughs>